Shliach. Um, it's also the name in the New Testament for, in the Hebrew for a, an apostle. So it's Numbers 13, 1 to 15, 41. Uh, now, I thought I'd start at the end. <laughs> Is that okay? And then we we'll get into this because I don't want, I want the beginning to be the last thing that we talk about because it's good. So this is, um, in this Torah portion is also about the fringes on the corners. Uh, remember we, Pastor Ainsley talked about it Sunday night and I think I did it the Sunday morning before. So the story goes is that um, this whole Torah portion is about the spies that went into the wilderness, went into the promised land and 10 came back with a negative report and two came with a good report, and it's like they've forgotten who God was. They've forgotten well, the what he said. So yeah, and it's quite a dangerous thing. So the, the fringes or the tassels on the corner of the garment were commanded by God to, to remind them constantly because they're wearing it. It's like trying a, a string around your finger. I better not forget. <laughs> and it's quite dangerous to forget because they died in the wilderness. So that's, that's one of the main things. But I just wanted to quickly show you this. Um, uh, so, yeah, oh, I'll just jump through a bit. So it was to remind the people to keep the commandments. God told the men of Israel to wear long tassels in the four corners of their garment. Observing the commandment to wear tassels is popular in Messianic Ju Judaism. It's also a controversial and touchy subject we encourage people to take a heart. So I just wanted to quickly show you some of the reasons why we don't actually practice it as Christians. Because um, it's, it's a subject that I would say it's a good reminder at home. And even to think about it, it's like, well, to remind ourselves like the practical application. But um, I'll just go through this. Uh, so we encourage people to take hold of the commandments, including tassels, but we're also concerned about keeping a balanced perspective that accords respect to the larger Jewish world. The commandment of wearing tassels seems like a strange commandment to us today because we no longer for, wear four-cornered garments. In ancient Near East, the traditional garment was a long rectangular piece of cloth with a hole cut in the center for the head. Tassels, seat seat, that hung down the four corners were merely decorative extensions of the threads used in the hem. Uh, but let me go, I just wanted to show you this pit. Um, no. So Jesus or Yeshua and the apostles wore tassels on the four corners of the garment. They used to grab Yeshua's tassels for miraculous healing. Yeshua, Yeshua criticised the Pharisees for ostentatiously lengthening their tassels. Show-offs. Uh, should believers wear tassels? The wearing of tassels is a commandment often abused in Messianic Judaism. It seems to be a popular commandment because it is an outward observance that conveys the appearance of religious depth. Jewish men should certainly wear tassels so long as they are in accord with traditional Judaism. Gentile believers should think carefully about this commandment before taking it on. Several considerations need to be weighed. Messianic believers often inadvertently send the wrong message with their tassels. First of all, unless they are tucked in, these tassels send a visual message to the world and to other Jews that a person is Jewish. Non-Messianic Jews can easily misinterpret this as disingenuous. Christian Gentiles seem to be putting on a Jewish costume to deceive people. Second, if a person wears tassels, they should be attached to a four-cornered garment. Uh, wearing tassels attached to one's belt does not fulfill the commandment since pants do not have four corners. So this is a misappropriation of Jewish tradition. If you do not have a four-cornered garment, you are not under any obligation to wear tassels. Once, once several of the teachers were doing filming in Israel, we had explained Messianic Judaism to a secular Israel member of our film, film crew, and he was intrigued. While having lunch with the film crew, we were recognised by a Messianic tourist who greeted us. Hanging off his belt loops were gigantic chrome-threaded blue tassels. Though he probably felt he was obeying the commandment of the tassels, he was doing it 
in a very offensive and obnoxious manner. It looked as if he were mocking the commandment. Our testimony to the secular Israeli was discredited. Third, when Messianic believers wear tassels visibly exposed but do not wear head coverings, a hat or yarmulke, observant Jews find it oxymoronic and deeply offensive. In my opinion, a person wearing exposed tassels should show enough discretion to abide by the Jewish conventions of keeping one's head covered. By the same token, a man who puts on a ritual pressure should have his head covered. Fourth, tassels are a visual cue to the Jewish world that a person is orthodox. In non-Messianic Judaism, only orthodox Jews wear tassels. Therefore, when a Messianic Jew is observed wearing tassels, but doing things that violate, violate orthodox standards, it discredits Yeshua in the eyes of the observant Jews. They perceive Messianics as Torah breakers. Um, and it goes, goes on that just says that you should be observant. Women should not wear tassels. Um, or if they do, they should not wear them the same manner as men's do. Jewish tradition does allow for women to wear tassels, but not in the same way that men wear them. When a woman wears visibly exposed tassels in the same fashion as men, or dons the traditional pressure, this may suggest to the observant Jews that she's a transvestite, lesbian, or strident feminist. So it's like, you can see all these, um, I'm giving you tons of things like why we say in the church, Please don't try and do Jewish observant stuff that is Jewish identity. I mean, that's a good that's a good reason. But I'm saying that um, do it in private. Yeah, do it in private. But even women can do it in private, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, of course, put a covering over them if they get the. Yeah. So it's like it's a, something that. It's commanded men to do, and if a woman goes out and does it in public, they look like they're, uh, yeah. Anyway, in addition to the above, a person should consider his heart's intention. If he's motivated to wear the tassels in obedience to the commandments, or does his heart take a private delight in being noticed by others? Sometimes messianic Gentiles take an unhealthy delight in being mistaken for Jews. The master criticised those who wore tassels for show. His disciples should be reluctant to pray their religious apparel. Nevertheless, it is a commandment to wear tassels. Gentile believers are certainly welcome to do so in imitation of Yeshua and obedience to the Torah if they desire. Basically, this is like the whole thing is do it in private. It, you, it's not a, how would you say, you have to, because it's like you have to wear a four-cornered four corner garment to actually have to do it. I mean, I'll do it in private if I want to have a really private prayer time and, or it's to do with healing. But I, I won't do that because I'm not Jewish. Yeah. Um, but I'm doing it in my privacy of my own home because and then I'm not going to offend anyone and I'm not showing off to anyone. Yeah. I mean, we've got to be really careful about showing off in Christ, as Christians because Jesus spent a lot of time rebuking um, the Pharisees that would show off how holy and religious they were. It's just to me, be yourself, and if God transforms your inside, then you're naturally, the holiness will come on the outside. You don't have to, to be like you guys say, get the inside of the cup right, and then the outside will follow suit. So I think there's enough about that. Let's jump up to... Can I ask a quick question, Mel? Yes. Is there even a... Is there an advantage to even praying with a pressure or even at home in private? Yeah, oh, it, again, it's, it, to me, it's like taking communion. Is there an advantage of taking a cup of, of um, red juice and matzah? If your faith attaches to the action, yes, but I've taken communion with nothing. Yeah, no, but communion is something that we... It's in the Bible. Yeah, it's for us. Yeah. But for, as a Gentile, like, even if I don't ever wear a thing, it doesn't really... It, do I gain anything by doing it if I do it in private? It's more of a, a, a action to remind you of a truth. So the taking of the cup or the communion cup, there's nothing in the cup. But my action and obedience to do it is but when I'm doing the action, I'm actually remembering Jesus, I'm remembering his blood, I'm remembering what he did, and I remember everything to do with the covenant. And it's like, it's exactly like the tassel. The tassel was to try and 
show them, remember your God. Remember your you're, you're wearing priestly garments now, you're, you're covered in His glory, that wherever these hands goes, the, glory, the, the, the Word of God goes. Um, it's it's a, a physical reminder. Um, I guess it's a little bit like the Jesus sticker you put on your car, except when you drive like a crazy person that discredits His name, but it's just an outward thing. But I'd strongly discourage Christians I mean, I remember Dick Rubin in the revival and we would see people in the congregation wearing these talits. They're not Jewish. And it's like, oh, it's it's a show-off thing. And it would would grieve a a Jewish person. And it's like, well, you're just trying to show that you're better than everybody else. And yeah, is that cool? Um, And what I mean, I, I... When I say, oh, I can take communion without actually doing it, I can just sit and close my eyes and meditate on the cross and think about the blood and experience the same thing that I do when I take the cup physically because I've built my faith up in that. So when something's going on, I will, you know what I mean? I'm switching my mind onto what I should and the cup and the bread is to switch to meditate with your heart, with your soul, with everything on that. And that's what actually connects you to God. It's got nothing to do with the cup. Is you it? understand a lot more of uh, what the tassel means, the whole garment means. It's beautiful. Uh, there, is, uh, there is something that happens in your heart. Because I know something did happen, you know, when I was speaking about it and listening to your sermon. And, uh, you know, I didn't know when to go home and then, you know, spend some time with God. Just, you know, it's like going to the closet and no one knows. Yeah. Just between me and God because there is something very powerful in that. Yeah. To be honest, I felt... It's like taking communion and you don't mean anything, you're just taking it. I felt bringing it out in the church, something really happened. Ah, I was watching Sunday night. More more miracles that you don't know what happened, you know. There's something in this. Continued on. We need to sort of not neglect it. In the future, mm. I'm thinking it's just like it's like revival broke off. I mean, people on Zoom was touched by the tussles, and they were they yeah. didn't have a tussle with them. Yeah, that's so powerful it was. I was watching with my mouth open and going, "Wow!" Yeah. <laughs> it's like look like revival uh, happened to me. Um, yeah, the Julie, her her legs just went like jelly. She couldn't stand at home, yeah. and uh, I got a whole thing from. I mean, he's only safe for six months from Eddie. It's, he said, like, revival has broken off with me. His whole life just changed. He felt the power of God just it's moving. Something. He's on Zoom. Yeah. So I'm, say, I'm saying it's something, it's good. It's not necessary. But please don't do it in the church or where others, it's not a show-off thing. That's all I'm saying. I, I really briefly touched that, but I was just showing you all the reasons. There's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't. And... Um, we need to respect, yeah, our brothers, the Jewish people. Let's jump into this because this is really important. Let me go to key. There we are, shliach. Send now. Um, I'll just jump down. So there's, this is talking about the spies, and this is really interesting. I don't know if anyone's seen this, but there's two versions of the story. So it says, send out for yourself men so that when they spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel, you shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. Numbers 13, 2. God told Moses to send 12 spies, one from each tribe, on a reconnaissance mission to spy out the land of Canaan. The mission was meant to be a prelude to the Israelite occupation. Moses chose 12 men and instructed them to travel through the land and make note of population centres, military fortifications, topography and agriculture. The spies, sent 40, the spies spent 40 days exploring before returning to report their findings. 10 of the spies gave bad reports, warning that although the land was good, the Canaanite populations were too formidable for conquest. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, gave good reports assuring the Israelites that God would provide victory. 
the Israelites chose to heed the words of the ten spies and began discussing a return to Egypt. God was irate with their lack of faith and damned them to 40 years and wandering in the wilderness. Now, I want you to, this is actually extremely relevant to us. This story is a prophetic picture of the future. So the promised land to us is the, the messianic age. It's when Messiah is going to come back. It's when we get redeemed, uh, like our bodies, resurrection of the dead and all that. And we should be labouring to enter into that rest according to the book of Hebrews. So there's a warning in here saying that how many of us are um, whinging and complaining about the promise? <laughs> you know, or we're getting in, let, let's keep going. But think about yourself in this. When Moses retells the story in Deuteronomy though, there's a discrepancy. In the Deuteronomy version, the spy mission is originally proposed by the Israelites, not God. The Israelites asked Moses to send spies ahead to get a lay of the land. So it says, then all of you approached me and said, let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring us back, bring us and bring, and bring back to us word of the way which, will be, which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me and I took 12 of your men, one man for each tribe, Deuteronomy 1, 22, 23. In the Deuteronomy version continues with Moses saying that their request seemed like a good idea to him at the time. He went along with it and sent out the spies. The stories in Numbers 13 reads differently. In Numbers version, it is God, not the Israelites, who initiates the spy mission. He commands Moses saying, send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, Numbers 13 too. In one version, the Israelites request the spy mission and Moses agrees. In the other version, God orders the spy mission. R Rashi can reconciles the two versions as follows. The children of Israel originally approached Moses and asked him to spend out spies on their behalf. The idea seemed good to Moses, but he thought that he'd better check with God first. The Lord realised that the children of Israel wanted to send spies because they distrusted his promises about the land in order to test their hearts. He consented to the plan, telling Moses, send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land by saying, for yourself. God was indicating that this was not his idea. This can be compared to a king who selected a bride for his son, a woman of virtue, beautiful, wealthy, and of noble pedigree. The prince, however, was not confident in his father's decision. He asked for permission to send one of his friends to check out the girl first. The king was irritated, but he agreed to the plan. The king sent one of his prince's friends to investigate the friend returned saying, she is indeed beautiful, wealthy and noble, but is she, she is not a good match for the prince. On this advice, the prince refused the match. When the king heard this, he said, in that case, you will never be married. <laughs> so like, what is our motivation for, uh, yeah. Does that speak a lot to me? It did. Um, if, if God promised we shouldn't have to send spies to check out the land, seeing if it's actually what he says it's going to be in the first place, but we, we're just like, well, we should be able to trust him, but our hearts are not right. So just say, The giant grapes. They came to the valley of Eshgol, I think that's how you pronounce it, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and f the figs. Numbers 13, 23. Moses told the spies to make an effort then to get some of the fruits of the land. Numbers 13, 20. It was the season of grape harvest, that is midsummer. Two of the spies came to a location a few miles north of Hebron, not far from where Abraham, their father, was buried. They found rich vineyards from which they cut a cluster of grapes so large that it needed to be carried on a pole between them. The Hebrew for cluster is Eshkol. The Torah says that the place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster Eshkol, 
which the sons of Israel cut down from there, Numbers 13, 24. They also bought pomegranates and figs with them. The image of two men carrying a large cluster of grapes on a pole has become iconic in Judaism. The giant cluster of grapes should have encouraged the Israelites. The land was indeed a good land full of bounty, just as God had promised. The ten spies, however, interpret the giant grapes differently. They used them as evidence that the land was inhabited by unconquerable giants. Some of the Canaanite tribes are probably much taller than the Israelites, but the spies exaggerated the size of the Canaanites. They reported that they had seen Canaanites so big that the average Israelite was, by comparison, no bigger than a bug. Of course, there are giant grapes. What would you expect in vineyards that belong to giants? The Israelites were disheartened by the report and lamented at their predicament. They remarked that they would be better off dying in Egypt or in the wilderness than facing military defeat in Canaan. They began to plot a rebellion. They looked for a leader they would appoint to take them back to Egypt. Does this... <laughs> Nobody has a problem with exaggerating how bad things are at all, no? No? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, and there's okay. a prophecy for them. They prophesied and they got it. <laughs> yeah. This to me is, it speaks a lot about what's our attitude towards the promises of God, what God promises in his word, it's about healing, about blessing us, about what he's going to do. I mean, do we really believe revival's going to break out? Or is it, oh, are we, we, we looking for excuses? Well, oh, you know, the church is not big enough. Um, you know, just say that they were a little bit bigger than the Israelites were, but you can exaggerate, I'm a bug in their sight. The, the problem is they came with, a, the thing is that they came with a negative report saying that, okay, well, that's what I was just saying about our church. Oh, we only have a small church. Oh, we only have a limited budget. Oh, um, you know, maybe the people here don't have the, the you know, a, a doctorate in Bible theology and all this sort of stuff. Like we make up all these excuses why it can't happen. Or I can't be healed because blah, 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 blah. Or I haven't prayed enough. Or I haven't done this enough. And it's like... We start exaggerating and making things worse than they are. Um, it's yeah. It, 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 so I, I, my thing, this is what I, I thought, forgive me for saying this, um, I guess this has happened to us. I find sometimes the pastors so positive and so encouraging, like they're so positive about the things of God, it's like, how can they be so positive? You know, this is, and I find myself complaining. And when I find out, it's like, well, maybe I actually should be like them after reading this. <laughs> I, should be, I should be that positive and that excited about the things of God and not um, making up excuses why God can't do what he's doing. Because isn't that putting ourselves in the position of the ten Ten spies when we start whinging and complaining and grumbling and making up, oh, that this isn't right and that's not right. Yeah. Can I one quick thing? Okay. Yeah. So, Lashon Hara. Lashon. It is Lashon Hara, evil speech. In so, the second temptation of Jesus was where Satan came to him and said, um, jump off from the top of the pinnacle and yeah. God will save you. And Jesus' reply was, it was written, you shall not tempt the Lord. And if you go back, that was said in Exodus, I think, which pretty much was, the Israelites said, is God with us? And God said, because you have tempted me, you will, like, there was a punishment for it. The whole point is, when God says that he's with us, even if it seems like he's not with us, we need to believe that he's with us. Close your mouth. Yes. <laughs> Like, yeah. Or like, I mean, what about the promise that, you know, he's going to bring your husband or wife or the promise that, you know, for children or to get out of debt or heal you? I mean, are you going to, oh, but this is wrong with me. Nobody's going to love me or this is not going to, and we get into that mode again. We're part of the 10 spies and we're starting to make up, exaggerate, oh, this is, 
and, and we're forgetting who God is. That, that, I mean, that's what that whole thing about the tassels was, keep reminding yourself, this is what His Word says, is because it's wrapped around my, the tassels, they wrap around their hands. It's like, no, this is what His Word says. And I keep reminding myself. It's like tying a string around my finger. Don't forget, God is faithful. Don't forget, God is faithful. Otherwise, you'll end up dying in the wilderness. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and your faith is of God, you know? And uh, it's confidence in God. But that has to be built up with relationship, though, isn't it? Correct. Again, reminding... Sorry? If he God, if he said it, then that's it. Mm -hmm. I write it down. But keep reading it again and again. keep reminding it. Exactly. That's right, memory. Exactly. Yeah. Faith well, comes by hearing and hearing. You, 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 you that's good. That word in your existence. That's really good. I, um, I actually use OneNote. And everything that I hear when God speaks to me, I write it down. Mm. And when I'm going through teaching, I write it down. And I go over it and over it and over it. And that's how I learn. And it actually reprograms your spiritual DNA when you keep you focused right. Let's keep going. This is going to open up even more. Joshua and Caleb had seen the same Canaanites, the same fortifications, the same giant grapes, but they had come to different conclusions. They said... We should by all means go up and take possession of the land, for we, shall, for we will surely overcome it. Numbers 13.30. They told the people, the land which we pass through to spire is an exceedingly good land, a land which flows with milk and honey. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Doesn't matter if they're nine feet tall. Numbers 14.7-9. Isn't it strange how two people can look at the same thing, such as a cluster of grapes, and come to an opposite conclusions? To Joshua and Caleb, giant grapes were a good thing. To the other spies, the giant grapes were a sign of despair. Joshua and Caleb. Let's just jump into this. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jeff Unia, <laughs> of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Numbers 14.6. We've already met Joshua in the Torah several times. His original name was Hosea. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. He was a personal servant of Moses. He'd been since his youth. At some point in his life, Moses renamed him by adding a letter Yod to the front of his name. Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Numbers 13, 16. Hoshea means Hoshea means salvation. Joshua, Yehoshua, means the Lord saves. When the name Joshua appears in Aramaic, it is truncated into Yeshua. Therefore, Yeshua is simply a short version of Yehoshua. Some of you, it's the first time you've heard the full name of Jesus. But to put it in English names and terms, the name Jesus is a short version of Joshua. So you can start seeing some pictures going on here. In Exodus 17, Moses sent Joshua out to lead the Israelites in the battle with the Amalekites. When Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the Torah and the instructions for the tabernacle, Joshua ascended partway with him and waited for him th through the 40 days. When Joshua heard the people celebrating and worshipping the golden calf, he mistook it for the sound of battle. Prior to the construction of the tabernacle, Moses met with God in a tent, which he pets outside the camp. Exodus 33.11 says that Joshua stayed in that tent. When Eldad and Medad began prophesying in the camp, Joshua was afraid they might be trying to assert Moses' role as head over the people. So he advised Moses to stop them. Later in the Torah, in the book of Joshua, he becomes the next leader of over Israel. I might give you a bit of insight into his character. He hung around Moses all this time. He was in the middle of it and he stayed faithful and learning. And then he ended up becoming a leader. Caleb, the son of Jephaniah, is a more obscure character. According to some opinions, he was not Jewish. His father was Kenzite. Kenzite. Through the Kenizzites, they were an Edomite clan. Jephaniah and his family had apparently joined the tribe of Judah. 
Caleb is reckoned as one of the leaders of Judah. According to rabbinic legend, he was married to Miriam, the sister of Moses, but there's no biblical reason for that suggestion. Caleb appears in the books of Joshua and Judges. In the land of Israel, he inherits the city of Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were buried. Joshua and Caleb are the only two spies out of the 12 to return with a positive report. My interjection here is that I can see this is the Jews and the Gentiles going into the Promised Land. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's a type. So, <laughs> and you can see that it was Jew and Gentile receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. It's the, the both, it's not just one, it's both. Um, Joshua and Caleb urged the children of Israel to obey God and take the land. The Lord reported, rewarded Joshua and Caleb for their faithfulness by exempting them from the doom that he placed on the rest of the adults of that generation. The 10 tests in the wilderness. Surely all the men have seen my glory, my signs which I performed in Egypt in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not listened to my voice. Numbers 14, 22. Though they attempted to dissuade the children of Israel from their rebellion, Joshua and Caleb could not stand against the tide of public opinion. The reports of the 10 spies had convinced the people, do not rebel against the Lord, Numbers 14, 9. Joshua and Caleb warned the people, but the people picked up stones to which to stone them. Just as a side remark, I heard an interesting TED talk saying it's usually the majority, the majority is not always right. <laughs> so, <laughs> the same here. Um, a church is not a democracy. It, and they might actually shock people, but God's house is not a democracy. It's not meant to be. It's, a, it's meant to be led by God. Um, the pastor can't um, preach according to a popular opinion of the, group, the largest group of people, otherwise he's not obeying God. He's led by people. So the pastor should have the ability to speak what God tells him to speak without, otherwise he's obeying man. So that's why it's not a democracy. So again, it doesn't matter about the majority. You know, so you know God showed you uh, what, what was going to happen when you preached on the tally. Remember when you were brushing your teeth? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to brush my teeth more often. You tell them that what, when, when you're brushing your teeth, you see people touching. Um, I didn't know what to talk about and you asked me to talk and then I just started brushing my teeth and then I seen a picture because I was studying the Tully, I was you know, trying to understand it a bit more and then I got a picture where I was trying, my, my teeth is, and I got it from studying the Jewish wedding stuff, is that the rabbi would have to hold the, the Tully over himself and then the, the bride and the groom would actually grab the corner of the garment. And when they do that, it's like the way God showed me is that they become one. They become, um, uh, it's like the talit was a, the, the, the reason that people are sick is a disconnection of relationship. If you are connected with God, if you're connected with God, you can't be sick. So if you repair the relationship, then you can't be sick. So that what I started, what he showed me with the talit, I'll get into what I've seen happening in the church, is that if we can deal with getting the relationship repaired, then people are gonna get healed. And what I've seen is that I had a picture, I came to church, but I didn't obey it, because I'm too shy sometimes. Um, to step out of the boat um, was that people were going to come out the front and grab a hold of the corner of the talit and be reconnected like they'd never have before with, with um, the Lord. And in doing so, they were going to get healed. And um, I sat down and then Pastor Anthony got up and did exactly what I was saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that told me it was God. That told me that, that was God showing me what he wanted to do. So, and, uh, and actually uh, something powerful happened from then on. Yeah, 
I, I, I just believe from studying it and seeing it, that God wants us healed. And um, part of what I, I've been, it's, it's healed for a purpose. It's like God's getting his body ready to, to bring about um, end time revival, to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. And you can't be serving sickness if you're meant to be doing that. So, yeah. I'll get the video up there one day soon, hopefully. God himself came to their rescue when they tried to stone them. This, this, the Torah says, the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel, Numbers 14, 10. The last time the Israelites had beheld the glory of God in such a visible manner, it was the day when Aaron and his sons began their service in the priesthood. On that occasion, the glory of God appeared before them to signify his pleasure. In Numbers 14, the glory of God appears before them to signify his displeasure. The Lord declared to Moses, I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them, and I will make you into a nation greater than they. Numbers 14, 12. So you can see that the glory of God can show up for two reasons there. Um, Moses interceded for the people just as he did after the incident of the golden calf. He argued that if God wiped out all the Israel, the nations would hear about it and God's reputation would be defamed. This is a repeat of, um, remember we are talking about the 13 attributes of mercy a while back? It's a massive key for learning to pray, intercede for people. It's like God showed Moses, if you pray this way, then it's a way of actually getting um, uh, God's mercy involved in situations like people are sick or tragedies going on. God taught us how to pray. I, the teaching's on the website somewhere, but Moses does the same exact thing. Um, and see how he says that it's gonna damage God's reputation. His name would be defamed if he, whatever. So I look at that and going, Lord, for your name's sake, for your reputation, heal such and such. Uh, uh, <laughs> For your name's sake, bring revival to this city. It's a way of praying. He, he appealed to the revelation of God's grace that the Lord revealed to him on Mount Sinai and even quoted that revelation back to God. And this is, this is it. But now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he may... By, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness. So it's giving there, this is the reason you're gonna pardon them because you are loving kind of your loving kindness. Just as you also forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. I mean, that's the key how we can intercede and pray for anyone that doesn't know God. It's awesome. Awesome. It's, right, it? it's huge, essential. Yeah, yeah, can you imagine that? If uh, God couldn't get what he wanted, so he destroys uh, the whole uh, tribes and uses um, the seed of Moses. Uh, well, yeah, Mo yeah, the seed of Moses. Isn't that amazing? God's character was at stake. God uh, foreknows everything. Uh, we need to dwell on that a, a lot in our private time. Can you imagine that? Uh, when Moses is saying to uh, God um, uh, that the, the nations would see that um, the people couldn't obey God, so God had to um, uh, raise up another... Um, through the seed, uh, raise up people through the seed of Moses. But God but he, knows everything. He's got, um, he, uh, he has a plan A and, and never a plan B. The people deserved, according to their sin, to um, die. But, but because Moses knew God, and the key is that he knew God, like he knew his character. Isn't there a scripture that says that them that know their God? Um, yeah, be strong and do great. So it's like those that know their God, it's like if you know how much God loves people 
And that's what I actually remember seeing with Steve Hill. He wept and cried for the people, but he knew he's God. He, and, and it's like, that's why so many people got saved in revival. Uh, yes, Gav? Uh, <clears throat> Norman, um, like, um, you know, the spies, right? The yeah. spies and the leaders of the tribes and the leaders of that area, they were all adults, right? And then God made them wander in the desert, wander in the desert until that generation had passed. Uh, anyone over the age of 20, yeah, died. Right. So then you could probably say that, like, it was only the children that entered the promised land. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. There's probably a lot in that, but, but let's just keep going a little bit because we're running out of time. And um, so the Lord relented and he pardoned them, but he swore by his own name that the men who had seen his power and miracles and tested him 10 times in the wilderness would not enter the land of promise. These 10 tests received some discussion in the Talmud including the incident with the spies, the sages identified 10 times that Israel tested God in the wilderness. The li following list with one modification is based on the Talmudic enumeration. And you can look at that another time. It's got it on video, but yeah. Most of the tests are examples of disbelief, disobedience, or both. Disbelief easily leads to disobedience. In Numbers 14, the children of Israel did not believe God would give them the land. Well, God would not give the healing. God would not do whatever. Therefore, they disobeyed. The Lord said that Israelites did not listen to his voice. An idiom that encompasses both unbelief and disobedience. Psalm 95 recalls the times when Israel tested God in the wilderness and warns us not to do the same. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Ma Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and they tried me. Though they had seen my work for 40, 40 years, I loathed that generation. And they said, they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. Psalm 95, 7 to 11. A different spirit, my, but my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered and his descendants shall take possession of it. Numbers 14, 24. The Lord spared the children of Israel, but he punished them by consigning them to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He declared that they would never see the promised land that they had rejected. Instead, their bodies would be buried in the wilderness. Their children, however, would be privileged to enter the land. Even Moses, Miriam and Aaron were included in the doom. Only Joshua and Caleb were given permission to enter the land. The Lord said that Caleb would be allowed to enter the land because he had a different spirit. Numbers 14, 24. Lord, give us a different spirit. <laughs> the different spirit of Caleb is evident from his report about the land. He and Joshua had seen the same Canaanites, the same fortifications and the same difficulties as the other spies, but he had come to different conclusion. The other spies saw the, those things as obstacles. Caleb and Joshua saw them as opportunities for God to demonstrate his glory. How much of the things that we see happening in our life, is it an obstacle or an opportunity for God to demonstrate his glory? Some people like to regard themselves as realists. You've heard someone say, I am not a pessimist, I'm a realist. Maybe you've said that yourself. I have, I have. <laughs> the inference is that an optimistic person is not realistic. According to the only honest and correct way to review the world, is to point out the deficiencies, difficulties, and inevitable failures. There is nothing special about having a realist attitude. Anyone can point out problems. Everyone can criticize. It takes no talent to be a naysayer. Maybe you know someone that, who is a rigid realist. Such a person is usually not realistic at all. Instead, a person like that demonstrates a tendency to emphasize the negative, ignore the positive, and disregard miracles. To that person, answers to prayer are more coincidences. 
Words of encouragement are irritating. Behind the veneer of cynicism is a, lack, a life of dark self-absorption and self-pity. <coughs> the 10 spies were such realists. They assessed the situation in terms of their own reality, a faithless reality. From that perspective, things look pretty dismal. A quick bar march back to Egypt was probably the best solution. Caleb and Joshua were a different kind of realist. To them, reality was not as big as God. They assessed the situation in terms of a reality that encompassed faith. The difference between Caleb's spirit and the spirit of the 10 spies is the difference between seeing life through the eyes of faith or faithlessness. The optimist says the cup is half full. The pessimist says the cup is half empty. The man of faith gives thanks that the cup is half full and he marvels that God will either make the half cup sufficient to meet his need or miraculously refill the cup. <laughs> People say every cloud has a silver lining. The optimist sees the silver lining. The pessimist sees the cloud. <laughs> the, the, the man of faith sees both the cloud and the silver lining. He gives thanks to God who made the cloud, provides the rain and clears the sky. <laughs> Caleb's spirit is something we should all strive to attain. To be a person of faith is something extraordinary. Little tests. Faith is usually not tested in big, obvious ways. A martyr might be told that if he does not renounce his faith, he will be killed. That's a big test of faith. Most of us, thank God, never have our faith tested on that level. Our tests of faith are far less obvious and far more ordinary. For example, suppose you are facing some financial difficulty. It seems like an impossible situation. How will you react? Will you let it pull you into depression or will you turn in confidence to your Father in heaven? Few things are more commonplace and financially devastating as vehicle repairs. One cold morning when the temperature was 18 below zero on the Fahrenheit scale, my father had a mishap while driving to work. His car radiator bounced loose, fell against the fan and was mangled. He had to walk eight miles to reach the nearest telephone. He told me the Lord had given me the ability to praise him despite the problem. The men who helped him tow his car into town accused him of just pretending to be cheerful. No one could be happy after trouble like that, they said. As was always the case in the early days of his preaching ministry, he had hardly any money to spare. He had $15 in his wallet that day. He knew that $15 would not cover the repairs, but he was confident in God. The owner of the local junkyard sold my father a used radiator for $15. It was a great deal, but it left no money to pay the shop for installing the radiator. By coincidence, the treasurer of a church where he had recently taught stopped in my father's workshop, workplace, and gave him a check for $14. We forgot to pay you last time you preached for us, he explained. Later that day, a friend stopped by with $3 he'd borrowed from my father. My father had forgotten about the money that the man had owed. After work, he went to the radiator shop to pick up his car. The bill was exactly $17. My father displayed Caleb's spirit of faith that day and God rewarded him for it. I've heard the complaints. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me, Numbers 14, 27. The Talmud comments on the story of the 10 spies and their evil report by saying, one who spreads evil reports almost denies the existence of God. God said he had heard the grumbling and the complaints of the children of Israel. He heard our complaints too. The sin of grumbling is related to the sin of gossip. Both are forms of evil speech. Both result from a critical spirit. Gossip destroys others, breaks up friendships and severs relationships. Grumbling destroys your ability of life and those around you. Imagine going to the zoo with a cranky and undisciplined five-year-old. You take the child to see the lions, but he's sulking because you did not buy him candy. You take him to see the zebras, but he's angry because he does not want to hold your hand in the crowd. You take him to see the monkeys, but he's having a fit because he wanted French fries. You buy him French fries, but he leaves them uneaten because he complains that they are soggy. At the end of the day, he did not see the lions, zebras and monkeys, nor did he eat French fries. He has had a miserable day and so have you. 
The child, the child transformed what could have been a wonderful experience into a horrible one for no good reason. As an adult, it's easy to look at a situation like that and realise how foolish the unruly child is being. It's harder to realise that our own complaints, grumbling and murmuring are just as petty. Adults are usually sophisticated enough to dis disguise their childish tantrums and inner discontentment. We disguise them as serious adult issues, concerns and complaints. On closer investigation, many of those in issues tend to be no more than sulking over soggy French fries. <laughs> The worst part is that it is not a trip to the zoo. This is your life. If you spend it fussing and sulking, you will never enjoy the good things God is continually doing for you. You will never even notice them. Not a it, question, but that was a really good teaching. I really need to hear that. That was awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, can you see how important it is to keep yourself studying the Bible? And especially I love the rabbinic perspective. They get the depth out of it. They've had thousands of years to study this. And when I read this, I'm like, oh, wow, this really speaks to me. <laughs> but it, it keeps you keeps your heart in the right place. Otherwise, yeah. So no more grumbling and complaining. Thank you, Lord, for your bread, the bread of presence. We come before you and, Lord, we repent for our grumbling and complaining right now. We want to have a spirit like Caleb and Joshua where we have <laughs> unbelievable, uh, courageous um, expectation that you're in control, that you're bigger than everything and anything around us. Mm. We ask, Lord, as we've been learning at Pentecost, that you can take out our stony, rebellious heart and give us a new heart, a heart after you, a heart that wants to be exactly what you've designed us to be. Give us a heart that's after you. Like King David, we cry out, give us a heart after you. Take out this rebellious, grumpy, whinging, complaining spirit from our, our hearts and give us a heart that is complete confidence in our God. I thank you, Lord, that your presence fills a, a heart of expectation in Jesus' name. I ask, Lord, that when we take this bread, that you heal us and equip us for the calling which you've called us to do, which is to bring heaven on earth, to bring holiness to this planet, to bring your glory down, Lord, to, to make this a dwelling place for our God. Equip us for the journey by healing our bodies, healing our minds, healing our emotions right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus has given us access to your presence. And we boldly come, Lord, and we ask for mercy upon our church. As Moses cried out, Lord, move because of your name's sake upon our church, because of the blood, for the blood and for your name's sake. Move in our church. Bring revival to our church, Lord. We, 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 we are grateful for what you have done, but we know that there is so much more. We want more of your presence, Lord. There must be so much more. We ask, Lord, because of the blood of Jesus that we have access to, to know you to be intimate with you, to experience your glory. I thank you right now that the blood of Jesus has given protection and healing for every member of our church, for everybody listening right now, that the blood of Jesus gives us access to your covenant of protection, of healing, of abundance, of um, provision right now. And we believe that when we take this, we, we're declaring the defeat of our enemy. We're declaring the victory and that we're going to receive the promises because of your blood and because of your name and because of what you've sent your son Yeshua to do for us in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.